good. If you guys will stand and let's sing together. Morning, everybody. So, who has something that they can write with and something that they can write on? All right, if you do, I need you to write down that next Sunday is our auction fundraiser meal. All right, and I want you guys to take a look. By no means am I attempting to be Vanna White, uh, by no means do I look like that. Uh, but I do want to show you a couple of the items that we will be auctioning off. Now, uh, every item that we've auctioned or that we're going to auction off next Sunday has been donated. And so this thing here, this cooler, is super nice and it's been donated to us by Walmart. And uh, this is a tool set that's also been donated by Lowe's and Brevard. And this is only a little bit of what has been donated. There's so many different things. And I know, I can't remember if it was first service or last or second service last week. That I was like, I'm not going to tell you guys what items we have. I just want you to come and allow that to be a surprise. But I will list off a couple other things. We've got a George Foreman. We've got a side table. We've got a coffee table. And uh, I'm going to stop there. But there's a lot of really, really neat things that we're going to be auctioning off that I believe a lot of you would have interest in. And so please, 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 there's a sign-up sheet on that back table uh, in the vestibule. And then there's a sign-up sheet right outside this side door here. If you are planning to come to the meal, or if you would like to, please sign up there. Once again, just kind of want to reiterate what the meal is for. So basically, all of the proceeds are going to go towards our student summer camp. And I want you to understand that uh, I actually had the opportunity to be in the student ministry here at EBC whenever I was in middle school, high school. And I had a sister, a sibling, that was around the same age. And so, as you can imagine... Two, paying for two beach retreats was a lot of money for my mom to try to come up with. And so by my youth pastor and youth group doing fundraisers and people in the church funding the students, I was able to go for free. And I just think back to the beach retreat and uh, the trip that all of the proceeds are going to go towards. And I think about how God saved me on those trips. And I just, if I would have never went, I'm not going to say that I wouldn't have gotten saved because God can do anything. But I would like to think that my life would be a little bit different. And so who's to say that there's not a kid like I was at one point in my life that's not saved, that has the opportunity to go on this trip that uh, needs funding. And so as of right now, we've got 83 kids signed up. And as you can imagine, out of 83 kids, I don't know exactly how many aren't saved, but I know there's at least one. And I would hope that that would be enough for you all to have a concern uh, that, hey, I want to fund these kids so that they can go on a trip 
And for those that have never heard of, of Jesus, or maybe they've heard his name, but they've never truly heard what Jesus came, but came on their behalf, uh, I would hope that that would stir your hearts. And uh, there again, that you would sign up and participate in our meal next Sunday, February 27th at 1230. Let's pray this morning. God, I thank you, Lord, for Jesus today. God, I thank you that because of Christ and what he has done for each and every one of us, Father, we can stand on two feet in boldness and strength and confidence in who you call us to be. God, we understand that life is difficult, and we understand, God, that life is full of burdens. But, Father, today we are here. I pray, God, that whatever we brought into this church sanctuary this morning, Father, that we would uh, leave it at the door and just turn our eyes and uh, focus on you this morning. Father, I pray for our auction meal as not only are we going to be auctioning off items, but uh, our students will be serving meals to people that come out and support. Father, I pray that you would allow this meal to be a meal that um, enables us to raise a lot of money to lower the cost of these students uh, just for summer camp in general. Uh, Lord, I think about how sometimes, you know, whenever we think of summer camp trips, we think about all it is is fun and games. But God, the reality is, is you change lives on these trips. And Father, I pray that um, if anyone here has a heart for students and has a heart to see teenagers uh, come to a knowledge that you died for them on their behalf, in their place, Father, I pray that they would take it upon themselves to sign up for the meal and uh, just to be there to support. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Father, I'm just so thankful for Calvary, God, that you sent your only son to give his life, God, so that we could have that hope of eternal salvation with you, Lord Jesus. And I just pray as Brother Steve comes that you would just touch our hearts and our minds to receive your word this morning. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for that worship. Good morning. I heard three. Let's do that again. Good morning. It's great to see you today. Um, man, I'm, I'm excited about next week. Y'all get to auction off George Foreman. <laughs> I, I didn't know that your youth pastor had such power that he could, could do that. And um, I, I think, guys, I think if he shaves, he looks a little bit like Vanna White, don't you? <laughs> Brian and I were discussing that in the back, so, so maybe we should get him to shave. Uh, I hope you've had a good week and uh, Valentine's week on Monday. Uh, guys, I sure hope you didn't forget it. If you did, I know what kind of water you've been in this week. Um, you, you know, we put, all, we put all our eggs in a basket, don't we, on one day. That's the day that if we, if we love someone, we buy them flowers, we get them cards, we get them candy, and the bigger the box, the more love we show for them. And... Um, isn't it sad? Because the way the world teaches, if you didn't get any cards and you didn't get any flowers and you didn't get any candy, then you must not be loved. And that's not true because God's love is unconditional. And it's the greatest thing we can have. So I, I hope that you've experienced his love this week. I hope that uh, you picked up an outline. Uh, I like outlines because at my age, I have to remember what I'm preaching on. So it helps me whenever I see the outline. But I hope that you, you have that, and I hope that you'll follow along. We're going to start a new message series. Uh, unless the Lord comes back or y'all do something and don't want me back, we're going to be here for four weeks and uh, doing a message series. And it's called Mercy Changes Everything. And so I, uh, I'm excited about what God has in store. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Father God, I just pray that you'll have me step aside. And Father, I pray that you'll speak to each one of us. And God, the most important thing is we pray that your Holy Spirit will fill this room, bind Satan from any distractions. And Lord, help us that uh, we will open our hearts and our minds to you so that we can leave different than we walk in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I think the, the greatest joy that there is in life is to be used by God for the purpose that he's created us to be. The greatest joy for me is the feeling of being used by God. That moment when you can say to yourself, I know this is what God's created me for. And if you've never felt that, then you're missing out. Listen, you were made for greatness. God created you for something special. He created each one of us, not just to live for ourselves. And we all need something bigger than ourselves. And we need to know that we were created for greatness. My life, your life is significant. And it's much more than a career. It's much more than an earning or a job. It's much more than the things that we gather. It's much more than the stuff that we have. It's much, much more than our, our abilities and talents. You were made for something eternal. And God created you for his glory so that you can serve him and serve others. So as we start this message series, today I'm talking about God can use anybody. Do you believe that? God can use anybody. Listen to Romans 6.13. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. Our skills, our abilities, our talents, our bodies can serve many purposes, good and bad, but in Christ, Everything that you do, everything that I do can be an instrument for service for God. Here's the problem. Many people don't believe that they have anything to offer. Many people 
don't believe that God can use them. And, and I think that many Christians don't believe that God can use them. Oh yeah, God could use her and God could use the guy over there. God can use the guy on the stage, but I could never do that. See, many of us believe that we're disqualified or that we're unqualified. Many, many Christians believe that they're disqualified because they know their past. You know your past, don't you? You know your sins, right? You know your failures. I was doing something the other day, and one of the questions was, what is my greatest weakness? I came up with 48. How do I get it down to one? We know ourselves, right? So there's no way, there's no way that God, that God could use me. So not only do we feel disqualified, but we feel unqualified. I don't have those talents. I can barely play the radio. So I don't have the talents, God. You can't use me. I don't have the education. I don't have the gifts. I don't have the background. Both of these are lies from Satan. Because God says that he's created each one of us unique. We're the apple of his eye. He says that he has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. And you know, if we look at the Bible and we look at history, you don't have to go anywhere farther than the life of the Apostle Paul to see that God can use anybody. And God wants to use you regardless of your age, regardless of your background, regardless of who you are. God wants to use you in an amazing ways. When we look at history, it seems that in the Bible, Paul is the one that God used in such an incredible way. Paul spread Christianity personally all over the Roman Empire. He planted churches everywhere. He wrote about half of the New Testament. And he's an amazing man. But you know what? Paul had a past. Paul had a history. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is writing to one of the churches. And it's a church in a Greek city called Corinth. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says that he uses five secrets of being used by God. And so it's on your outlines. It's Paul's secrets of staying usable. Now, in preparing this um, and, and being in different churches, I, I realize that sometimes um, people will say, well, you're going to be talking to senior adults or you're going to be talking to established adults or you're going to be talking to youth. And so sometimes you'll try to put the message a little different. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that this is age difference. So for those of us who are over 21, and we've settled back and we say we're just waiting for the Lord to come home, stop it. God's got something for you to do. How do I know that? Do this. It's got something for you to do. So remember that. I was sitting over there thinking, uh, because my, my life was rearranged from this church and from the student ministry. And just listening to the fact, and I don't know if I heard it before or not, but listening to the fact that you've got a student pastor who's got 83 students going to youth camp. And the very first thing he said was, this is where my life changed. Senior adults, I remember coming here at 20 years old for the first time to Etowah Church and having a few of the senior adults getting to know me and me getting to know them and them investing in my life as a college student. I know you've got, you've got uh, Tuesday ministry and it's going great. So seniors, there's things that God has for you to do and for each one of us. So here's Paul's first secret. The very first secret is this. Never forget it's all because of God's mercy. Never forget it's all because of God's mercy. The definition of mercy is undeserved forgiveness and unearned kindness. Undeserved forgiveness, unearned kindness. When someone forgives you, you don't deserve it. 
I don't deserve it. When someone does something kind for me, I don't know about you, it's part of my personality. When someone does something kind for me, I got to do something kind for them. And God's still working with me on that. And so when someone does something kind for you and you can't pay them back, that's unearned kindness. God treats you and I, listen, God treats you and I with mercy every second of our day every second of our lives. Everything God does in you is because of his mercy. Everything God does for you is because of his mercy. Everything that God does with you is because of mercy. And everything that God does through you, he does by his mercy. It's all because of his mercy. Everything. 2 Corinthians 4.1 says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. God in his mercy has given us work to do. Christian, God in his, his mercy has given you and I work to do, and that work is called ministry. Boy, we, we get shy away from that sometimes. If I were to have in the bulletin and I were to say, we have a new ministry and we new, need new ministers to do that, some of us might think, well, somebody else has got to get in line for that. See, the word ministry is something that's been, been tainted and been taken out of context. Because the Bible tells us that any time, as Christians, any time that we do anything for someone else, that is ministry. Any time that we use our talents and our abilities and our gifts that God has given us to help somebody else, that's ministry. Ministry is not just what we do in church. In fact, most of ministry, listen, most of ministry is done outside of church. That's ministry. This is a training center so that you and I can go out and do ministry. And so God wants every person, every Christian to minister and to have a ministry. Everyone. Here's the problem. Many Christians aren't doing it. Anything that you do when you use your talents and your gifts and, and your abilities that God has given you to help someone else, that's ministry. You were created to make a contribution for someone else. You were created to serve God and to serve others. And it's all because of God's ministry. And when we understand, when you and I will understand that God shows us mercy every single moment of our day, that he loves us unconditionally, that there is nothing that you can do to stop God from loving you. And there is nothing that you can do to make him love you more. And there is nothing that you can do to blow it to where God says, I'm done. When you and I really understand that, it does a couple of things. First of all, when we understand God's mercy, we don't have to try to prove our worth. It's not about church attendance. It's not about getting more things. It's not about giving more things. God loves you. He loves you. He sent his son to die for you. The Bible says he gave his all. That means you are worth his all. Not how much you work, not how much you acquire, not whether you have a lot or a little bit, but the Bible says you're worth is his all. The other thing that we understand whenever we understand God's mercy is when I understand God's mercy, I don't have to wallow in my mistakes. Now, I tried coming up with a more spiritual word and I thought, well, that's not what I want to say. Because I don't know about you, but I wallow in my mistakes. Um, last week was a very frustrating and beat myself up type of week. And I was wallowing around. I was out when I was riding this, I was out, I took one of my dogs out. One of my dogs, I have ferocious dogs. One of them is a Rottweiler German Shepherd. He weighs about 10 pounds. Uh, he's about that tall and he will tear you up. 
by licking you. <laughs> and he likes to go out in the yard and he likes to get on the, on the, the we don't have grass. We're, we're in, on a mountaintop and we don't have grass. We have this cream stuff that florists use. And so he gets out there and he scratches and he runs around and he rolls around and he looks like a horse with his legs straight up. And he loves to waller in that. Have you ever done that with your mistakes and your sins? Poor pitiful me. I'm going to eat worms. I'm so, I'm so bad. I'm such an awful person. God can never use me. God doesn't love me. Look at what all's happening in my life. When we understand God's mercy, we don't do that. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone has a past. I don't know your past. And you don't know my past. But you know who does know your past? Listen, God knows your past. Amen. And he gave his all for you. And so if we confess our sins, God says the past is forgotten. How far is the past forgotten? Wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if we could forget our past like God does? Amen. It's as far as the east is from the west. I don't know about you, but Satan stands right here with me and he'll click me in the head and say, you know what you just did? That was dumb. That was evil. How can you do that? And I'll do one of two things. I'll realize what my worth is in Christ and I'll say it right back and that's the end of it or I'll waller. And so when we understand God's mercy, we understand what it says in Galatians 1, chapter 13. Paul says, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism. We know what all he's done. I mean, he was a persecutor of Christians. He wanted to destroy the Christian faith. How intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. But when God who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace was what? Pleased. Please. I've shared with you mine and Linda's story. We never had children. We adopted a 15 and a half year old 20 years ago. And now we have an eight year old. And we feel like Abraham and Sarah every day. And one of the things that I've realized is it's not about my time necessarily. It's not about the love. It's not about the things. One of his love languages is whenever I say, Cullen, I am so proud of you. He just lights up. Do you know what God said to Paul? He was pleased. Christian, you know what God says to you? You're the apple of his eye. And God knows everything about you. And he loves you. And God knew everything about Paul. And he showed Paul his mercy. And everything in his life changed. Think about this. God uses people in spite of their brokenness. God has never, ever, ever used a perfect person because there's never been a perfect person except Jesus Christ. And God wants to use flawed people. God wants to use broken people. He wants to use weak people. He wants to use hurting people. God wants to use people who do not have it all together. Does any of that fit you? Because it's me to a T. And all of that is because of the mercy of God. So God wants you and I to never forget that he created you, that he loves you, that he wants to partner with you. God wants to partner with you so that you can do what God has intended to work through you. Write this down, if you will. Write it on your hand if you don't have a piece of paper. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. By the way, we think of saints as we drive down the road. The church, St. Timothy, St. Peter, all this. No. It's someone who's accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. And so the person you think that is so godly, that's such a great Christian, that's such a powerful person for God, they are a sinner Amen. saved by grace. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. And that's because of the mercy of God. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
When you and I use our talents and our gifts and our abilities and our experience to help somebody else, to serve somebody else, and to serve God, that is called ministry. And that is the starting point for you and I to understand God's mercy. Here's the second thing. Y'all still with me? Second thing is this. Paul says, if you want to be usable by God, you've got to be real. I could do a whole message on this right here, especially to church people. Because I know you're not like this, but I've been like this many ways. I'm getting ready to go to church, so I've got to put on my church face. Because we got to walk a little different. we got to talk a little different. We've got to act a little different. And that's church tradition. And you know what? That's wrong. We've got to be real. And Paul, Paul tells us, you must be real. You've got to be genuine. You've got to be yourself. God did not create anyone in here to be anybody else except yourself. You're unique. You're one of a kind. Lynn and I have been blessed in our life and um, we, we've gotten a couple of items in our lives. Uh, remember, John Love is, was Linda's father, so he collect, we collect. And one of the things that we like is antiques. And we've, it, along our journey, we found one or two small pieces that are one of a kind. Now, I don't know if there's 30 of them sitting in somebody else's house or not, but we were told they were one of a kind. You know what the Bible says? God who created the universe said you are one of a kind. Why is it that we try so hard to be like everybody else? Why is it, Christian, that we try to fit in with everyone else? We try to look like everyone else. We try to act like everyone else. We try to dress like everyone else. That's what the world wants us to do. But God says when you and I try to be someone else that we're not, a couple of things happen. First of all, when we try to be somebody else that we're not, we will be under a lot of stress all the time. We'll be under a lot of stress all the time. The other thing is you're going to have a fear of being exposed. What if they see who I'm really like? I know that there's many people that I've served with in church and many people that have come to church and they're so afraid that someone in church would know what they have been like. Isn't that a shame? In my family, I was able to tell my parents. I didn't always do it, but because of their love for me, I was able to tell them, here's some of the stuff I've done. Here's some of the stuff that I've been involved in. And something else that happens is whenever you're always trying to, to be somebody else, we try to manipulate people because we don't want them to see the real us. Here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.2. He says, rather we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's con uh, conscience in the, sight, in the sight of God. Paul says, we don't play games. We don't fake it. We don't manipula manipulate behind the scenes. We don't twist God's word around to suit ourselves. We don't make things about ourselves. What we do is we bring everything out in the open. We display the truth so the world can see who we are and who God is. Christian, you and I have got to be real. The number one barrier to keep people from being used by God, the number one barrier that people don't receive God's mercy in, in presence in their life, the number one reason is the fear of being real. God gave his all for you and he knew everything about you. So we live behind walls and we fake it and we wear a mask and we live lives of insecurity. And the antidote to your insecurity and the antidote to my insecurity and all those fears is to be real and understand God loves you and to receive the spirit of God's mercy in you. And when I understand that God really loves me unconditionally, 
that he is never going to stop loving me, that his mercy is going to be with me for the rest of my life and through eternity, no matter what I do, no matter how I blow it, no matter the mistakes. When I understand that, my life changes. And folks, we get tired, and when we get tired, we forget things, and we forget that he loves us. But what we can do is we can understand that God says he will never ever leave us or forsake us. Paul says this in Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive a spirit. He's talking to us, Christian. He says, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But as a Christian, you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Kellen ran up to me one day this week and he was in tears and he grabbed me really tight and he said, Papa. And we can do that to God. We can run up to God and say, Daddy, Daddy, Father, forgive me. Daddy, Father, I feel like a failure. And you know what he says? You are a failure. You're a loser. Get away. No. He says, stop feeling that way. I gave my all for you. In Romans 8.15, Paul says there are two ways that you and I can live our lives. We can either live our lives under the bondage of the spirit of fear, or we can live free as a child of God under the mercy of God. And when we understand that we are a child of God and we realize that it's all about God's mercy, we don't have to fake it anymore. There's a third key that Paul says that if you want to be used by God and, Christian, if you want to remain usable by God, you've got to remember this. It is not about you. It is not about you. Christian, every time that you and I forget that, we get bitter with our problems. Every time we forget that, we get prideful with our blessings. When you and I forget that it's not about you, we take everything personally. God, how could you do this to me? God, how could you allow this to happen? Those people over there are doing this to me, God. Whenever we forget it, we take everything personally. In 2 Corinthians 4 or 5, Paul says, we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus Christ. Paul is saying this. He's saying, remember, the message is not about us. Our purpose is not about us. We are here to proclaim Jesus Christ. We are his messengers. We are his errand runners. When I first wrote that down, I thought, that doesn't sound good. And then God said, what? To be a messenger of the creator of the universe? Are you kidding me? What an awesome thing. I am here today as a representative, as a messenger of Jesus Christ, not of Steve. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't give me 10 minutes of my time to listen to what Steve had to say. But I'm a messenger of Christ. And Paul reminds us, it's not about us, it's all about Jesus. Paul is very clear. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, he says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. You know what he's saying here? He's saying that as Christians, we're like jars of clay. And we've got this treasure inside of us. But here's the problem. Some of us keep the lid on and we try to keep everything okay. But we've got to understand, what happens whenever you drop a clay pot? It breaks. You know what? We're broken. I'm cracked. I'm a cracked pot. And so are you. 
And what happens when you take a cracked pot and try to put it together and you put a light in it? The light shines through it. And the real treasure in you, the real treasure in me is God. As a Christian, he puts his Holy Spirit in us. He puts his power in us. He puts his love in us. He puts his mercy inside of us. So the real treasure is God. And so we are supposed to be cracked pots and we allow God's light to shine through us. And I believe that many times God uses our weaknesses more than he does our strengths. God uses our weaknesses more than he does our strengths whenever we're willing to be real, when we're willing to let people know that we're broken. Because in a broken pot, the light will shine out. And even though we're weak, God uses us to spread his message of love and hope and mercy. And knowing that the power is not ours should keep us from pride and should motivate us to keep daily contact with God through a daily relationship, through prayer and reading his word so that the light continues to shine through us. And our responsibility is to let people see God through our cracked and broken lives. So many times the world says... Well, those people at that church think they're better than we are, but we know them. I wonder how many Christians let them know, you know what? I'm just a sinner like you. Some days I blow it. Some days I don't. And the days that I don't blow it is because I put God in the driver's seat. Paul says something else, and I believe this. I hope you're still with me. I believe that if you and I will will do this next thing, God will use us in incredible ways. I've seen it over and over and over again in my life. Paul says, use your pain to help others. Use your pain to help others. Isn't that contrary to what the world teaches us? Don't let them see you cry. Don't let them see you hurt. Don't let them see your failures. Push them in a closet. Don't let them see your sins. Don't let them see your mistakes. If you and I as Christians will use the things that we're ashamed of, if we'll use the things that have hurt us most, if we will use the things that have been the biggest problems in our lives, if we will use all these things in order to help someone else, God will use us in an incredible way. Your pain to help others. I've got someone in my life who's very dear, and and according to the doctors in the world, he is dying. And this week he wrote, I am not dying, I am living for Christ. If we will take our pain and share it with other people, not dump it, but share it. All I can tell you is here's where I was, here's what God did, and I don't know how it worked out. Then God will use it. God used Paul's enormous pain and his mess ups and the crazy things that he did. He used it in an amazing way all through his life to bring people to Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9. He says, we are hard pressed on every side. Do you feel that way? Do you feel like everything's just closing in? He says, we're hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. And struck down, but not destroyed. Man, last week I was struck down. And then God used my accountability partner, which is my wife. And she just said one little thing. Paul says we are struck down, but not destroyed. You know what Paul's talking about here? He's talking about redemptive suffering. Redemptive suffering is whenever you use suffering for the benefit of someone else. There's three kinds of suffering. By the way, God will use all the suffering in our lives 
to help other people if we allow it. But there's three kinds of suffering. There's the kind of suffering that I bring on myself. I love chocolate, I love candy, I love sweets, I love cake, so I'm gonna eat it all, and then it's gonna mess up my life because I'm not exercising. So the things that I do to myself, God will use that to help somebody else. There's another kind of suffering, and it's innocent suffering. Through no fault of our own, Somebody else has hurt us. A child is molested. Maybe someone was in an accident because of a drunk driver. Maybe you were scammed or ripped off. That's innocent suffering. And then the last suffering is the highest form of suffering. It's redemptive suffering. It's where you choose, it's where I choose to put up with my pain and my problems and your pain and your problems in order to help somebody else, in order to bless someone. As Jesus hung on the cross, he did not die, he did not hang on the cross and die on the cross for his sins. He died for your sins. He died for my sins. He died for the world's sin. Do you understand that he died for those people who will never take the gift? He still died for them. That's redemptive suffering. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4.15. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is searching, reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. God can and he will use your suffering and your problems and he can and use my problems if we will allow him to do so and if we will, will receive God's mercy and if we will say, God, whatever you want to do with this mess, I'm willing to allow you to do it as I serve you and serve others. And Paul says that all of these sufferings are why he puts up with them for the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Paul says he's not giving up. How could we give up? Because this little journey that we're on is nothing, Christian. It's nothing compared to eternity. On the outside, I am wasting away. Um, I had open heart surgery uh, a few years ago. I was doing mission work. I came back from the mission trip. Uh, I went mountain. I love to mountain climb. So the last day I went mountain climbing on a 4,500 foot mountain, which from Florida is a big mountain up here. It's not too big and repelling and all. The next morning I preached and then Sunday night I was in the hospital and they said, you got to have open heart surgery. You have the widow maker. I said, what? I have indigestion. No, you have the widow maker. And I look back at that, and during that time, I'm like, God, what are you doing? This is the craziest thing. You've got nine, I've got 98% blockage in all these arteries, and I had no pain and no suffering and no anything, and now I've got to have open heart surgery and take 10 weeks to recover. God, that's crazy. How can I get my work done? God says that he will take our pain and our struggle and I remember getting up from the hospital the very first time I got up and I looked in the mirror and you know who I saw? My father. I looked at myself and I saw, that's my dad in the mirror. And I realized then I'm getting old. Things are changing. You see on the outward, uh, outward appearance, I am wasting away. But on the inside, I'm going to live forever. I have no problems because all this is temporary and it's all because of God's mercy. The fifth secret is this, and I hope you're still with me. The fifth secret, Paul says, is stay focused on eternity. Stay focused on eternity. My friend wrote a couple of weeks ago that 
this, this disease that he's going through is not going to beat him because he's already won. He's going to live for eternity. We forget that, don't we, when we're feeling bad. Oh, this, this cold is the worst thing I've ever gone through. Now, does it hurt? Yes. And that's what Paul's saying. But what we've got to do is we've got to maintain an internal perspective. That's the only way for us to get over being overwhelmed by our problems. The bigger your picture of God is, the smaller your problems are. The bigger my picture of God is, the smaller my problems are. The more you and I understand that what we're going through is just temporary because we're going to live with God for eternity. This body is not what I'm going to live with for eternity. I'm not going to have any scars. I broke my leg in four fractures all the way through. I had several plastic surgeries. My leg still looks like a, a mess. I've got marks down here. And I had head surgery. I've got marks everywhere. I'm just not a pretty thing to look at. But you know what? This is just a shell. I'm going to be in heaven one day. And I won't have any more sickness. We will not have COVID anymore. We won't have to go to God and he says, sorry, because of COVID, I'm a little busy. We won't be put on hold because it will all be over. But we've got to stay focused on eternity. Paul says this, and I'm going to read from the message translation. We're almost done. Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, these hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times, the lavish celebration prepared for us. And knowing that we who are Christians, those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, will live with him forever. I don't know what it's like. I really believe there's going to be mountains I really believe there's going to be, sorry for those who don't like the cold, there's going to be skiing, which means there's going to be snow. Maybe it'll be comfortable weather. I believe that the oceans are going to be fantastic because I love to go diving. I believe that the, the weather, you like cool weather, you like hot weather, I like the fall. I believe the weather is going to be just fantastic but I know this more than anything. We're going to be so focused on God, it won't matter. And we'll never have pain. We'll never have sickness. We'll never get up in the morning and go, oh, that's a new hurt. That's a new pain. And we've got to stay focused. And then Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4.18. He says, there's four more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today, gone tomorrow, but the things that we can't see now will last forever. He says, Christian, if you want to be used by God, senior, if you want to be used by God, young person, if you want to be used by God, stay focused on eternity. It's all about this. We are offering adults, we are offering nothing to the new generation as far as this world is concerned. Are you kidding me? We're in a situation where you don't even have to put on your birth certificate if you're male or female. What's that about? We're changing it to where God means nothing. We're offering this generation nothing except God. And that's everything. Everything. And so you and I as Christians got to remain focused on what eternity is. And that is the key. And here's the key to stay in focus. And it's our last fill in, I believe. And this is so important. And it's so important for each one of us. We've got to stay focused by support and accountability from other Christians. Do you know that there was nowhere that I can find on record that Paul went by himself. Most of the time he had a small group with him so that he could have accountability and support with them. And Christians, we need that. And I believe that the, the biggest thing that has happened during the last two years is Christians have hurried and scurried out away from one another. And we're hiding and we're on our own. 
We don't even want to touch each other. And we're all on our own and doing our own thing. And we don't have small groups and we don't have discipleship and we don't have this. And we're not getting together with our Christian friends. And I believe that that's what Satan wants. And Paul is telling us that as Christians, we've got to have support and accountability. He says this in Ecclesiastes 4.12. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And then in Matthew 18, 20, he says, where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. And God says this, he says, if two or three Christians will get together in his name, he'll be with them. And when that happens, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so the support and the prayers of encouragement, the honesty of other believers the importance of Tuesdays, Together Tuesdays for senior adults, the importance of the student ministry every time they get together, the importance of the sports ministry for the athletes to get together, the importance of a men's ministry or woman's ministry, a discipleship group, a Sunday school group. All those are very important so that you can just hang out with other believers of calling your friends and saying, let's go to dinner or come over here. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. It doesn't matter, but let's get together because we need to stay together as Christians. And what happens is that helps us to remember these things. In closing, if mercy is God's number one character trait that he reveals to us in the Bible, if God's mercy is the most important thing that he wants you and I to know about, then it must be the most important thing for us to learn. And it must also be the most important character trait for us to have in our lives so that we can share with other people. Because God wants to develop his mercy in your life and in my life so that we can go out and shine and share his mercy and his love with other people. I don't know your heart. I believe that probably most everyone here knows that if anything happened to them today, that they would go to be with the Lord. Not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus had done. But if you do not know that, it's not about this church. It's not about me. It's about God. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. For your sins. And so all we have to do is accept his gift and allow him to work his mercy in our lives. If you've never done that, you can do it right where you're seated. If you have done it, these things that Paul says, we've got to remind ourselves every day so that we can get up and go through this life realizing it's all about what's coming. It's all about what's going to happen for eternity. And it's all because of God's mercy. We're going to be continuing this series. I'm not sure where it's headed. God does. And for the next uh, three Sundays, I want to encourage you this. If you know someone who's not been in church for a while, if you know somebody who's never been to church, I want to encourage you, ask them to come, not to see who's speaking, but to come hear from God. We're going to be talking about God's mercy and how valuable we are because of all that God has given us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your strength and forgiveness. And we thank you most of all for sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. And God, as we come to a time where we want to hear from you and say, God, is there anything in me that I need to change? Is there anything in me that you want to take? Is there anything in me that you want to bring up? Search each one of us now, Lord, and share with us. And then, Father, if God brings anything, if you bring anything up to us, Lord, help us to confess it and leave it right here. You pray with your eyes open. If there's anybody that has anything that you want to pray with, I'll be down at the front. 
You're more than welcome to come and pray with me. You can pray right where you're at. But more, most of all, don't leave today without anything between you and God. Let's go ahead and stand for our invitation hymn.
Before we pray um, for our offering, I just want to remind everybody that this coming Wednesday night is business meeting. And if you don't come to the business meetings, make that a priority. Some weeks, they're not very long. They might be 10, 15 minutes long because there's not a whole lot to discuss. But then other weeks, we have things that really need to be discussed and that really need to be voted on or things done. And we need you there. We need you to help us as leaders decide what needs to be done and, and bring things before you so that that's when you can talk about them and, and ask questions. So please consider being here this Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, for our business meeting. Thank you, and let's pray for the offering. Dear God, I just thank you so much for everything that you're doing. And I ask you to take this offering that we're about to receive and use it for your glory and your glory only that guide us into where you'd have us to use each penny that's given. I love you and praise you and give you all the glory in Christ's name. Amen. Just got two little things before we leave. Want to remind you, one, today, make sure you sign up for next Sunday for the youth lunch and auction and support these youth as they go to camp and help them go to camp. Um, so be sure and sign up out this way or this way on the sign-up sheets. Also, senior adults, if you haven't been coming to senior adults, come. This is a time that you can come and you can use the gifts God's given you to talk to people who maybe haven't been before or people that maybe they don't go to church but they come to the Tuesdays uh, get together. You can use that gift and you can talk to, to them and just help someone because we have had people that I know for a fact have come to me and said, you know, this is the only decent meal I get a week. And you could, you know, that is encouraging when they say that. Or they may say, you know, I don't see very many people. And you can talk to them and, and let them know that they are loved. So hope to see you there Tuesday. Um, we have, I told them, we have a special guest coming. And uh, can't wait to introduce that guest to you. Um, so anyway, uh, be there 10 o'clock, 10 to 1. And... Um, we will be looking for you. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for the message that Steve has brought us. And um, apply those words to our hearts and us to your service as we go out the doors. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>